Morning. I'm gonna sit down today because I don't feel very well. So um, y'all pray for me in that. Y'all know how I like to march around and give the camera guys a hard time changing directions real quick, but I'm gonna sit down today. <laughs> I also won't be shaking hands at the end because I don't want to get any of the rest of you sick as well. So you can just appreciate that from me. That's my gift to you today. <laughs> We're starting a new series called Think Small, and it's about small groups. And I think as we start this series, what I don't want you to do over the next two weeks is I don't want you to think, uh-oh, Jeremy's trying to pressure me into being in a small group, you know, or, or something like that. I want you to really hear the heart of who we are as a church, and I want you to hear my heart for how important I think small groups is. And we're going to be looking at scripture, lots of different scriptures today. This, as to how important the New Testament says small groups are as well. You know, that last song is so powerful. You know, Jesus, all I want is to be like you. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be Christ-like. So it means to be a follower of Jesus. And if we really do want to be like Jesus, then we'll be in a small group. <laughs> Jesus spent most of his ministry in a group of 12 guys, just surrounded by these 12 guys. He was in a small group. He was, he was kind of the one who gave us this model of small groups. But before we really get into what small groups are all about, there was a show that I always uh, used to like to watch when I was a kid. And some of you weren't a kid when this show was coming on, but I was a kid at that point in time. And, but it came on really late at night. And, and usually the only time I, I got to watch it was on a Friday night after a high school football game or something like that when we were already up. Is the Johnny Carson show. Anybody remember that? Yeah, Johnny Carson show. I loved, I, I, I didn't understand most of it, you know. I was a kid, but I just liked it. So sometimes I'd get to watch Johnny Carson on Friday nights. But sometimes during the summer, my parents would let me stay up and watch it during, throughout the week. And there was another show that came on before, sometime before Johnny Carson on one of those nights. I think it was Thursday night, but I can't really remember. Where I, I, I've certainly seen the show and I've watched it and I know the characters. But I know it more for its theme song than for the actual show. And I'm going to sing it here, okay? And I want you to sing it with me. So don't leave me alone up here. Okay, here it goes. Making your way in the world today. There you go. Taking a break from all your worries. Don't leave me alone. Sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? I need to hear you this time. Sometimes you want to go. Da, 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 da. And they're always glad you came. Da, da, da. You want to be where you can see. <laughs> you want to be where your name. Da, 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 you remember that song, don't you? Even more than the show for, for me. I remember that song, and you can thank me later for getting that stuck in your head all day. That's another little gift I leave with you. That was the theme song for Cheers. You remember what they would say when, when Norm would come in? What would they say? Norm. Norm. Yeah, and you remember all the Cliff and all the characters there. It was a great show. I think the reason people like that show, there's probably a lot of reasons, <clears throat> but I think one of the reasons is because of that theme song. Doesn't it sound good to go where everybody knows your name? You want to see where troubles are, where you can see troubles are all the same. You want to go where everybody knows your name. That sounds good. And, and that's really what the church should be about. It should be a place where you can at least find some sort of community like that, where everybody knows your name. And here at Niceville UMC, we feel like that's critically important. Like you saw in that little bumper video before the sermon, we're a big church. And so it's important to somehow get connected in smaller ways. And we feel like that theme song to Cheers, you know, it speaks to one of our basic human needs. That is to be loved and accepted. That's just the basic human need that we all have. And I think it's a God-sized human need, a God-shaped hum human need that he's given us so that we'd have to need each other. And, and I would say, especially in a military town where there's people moving in, even right now, there's all kinds of people moving into town and people moving away from town. It's especially important to have a place where everybody knows your name, where you can know where, that you belong here, where you can find some sort of community. 
And there's some research done uh, by some scholars and they, they noted that there's, there's basically 50 important passages about what the church is all about in the New Testament. And did, did you know that the most common thing that those 50 important passages about what the church is all about talk about is fellowship? Fellowship. Inside those 50 some scriptures about what the church is all about, there's 21 commands that talk, that talk about do something to one another. There's 21 one another commands in the New Testament that instruct us with, on how to live together, how to, how to do life together, how to have fellowship. And the overarching command is to love. You know that from Jesus, love God, love your neighbor, it's to love. We're going to be going through a lot of scripture here, so I just want to just look at what's going on on the screen. And if you want to go back and look at them later, you, you get a connect notes when you walk in, if you want one of those, or sometimes it's in your bulletin, check that out. John 13, 35, Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, love gets shown in a lot of different ways in, in, the, in the, those other 20 passages that I mentioned. There's 21, that love gets shown in a lot of different ways. Romans 12, 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Romans 15.7, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. See, the Bible just told you to sing, all right? <laughs> just a little reminder. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, rather serve one another. Lots of one another commands. But the problem is in our culture today, we're so busy that when we do a message series, when we tell you to get in a small group or how we're supposed to relate to one another, a lot of times we go, Jeremy, that's unrealistic to just add one more thing to my busy schedule. But here's the deal. If we're really gonna follow Jesus and live out his commands and how we should relate to one another, specifically loving one another, then we have to spend time with one another. Love is spelled T-I-M-E. We have to spend time with one another. Most of us will never be motivated to serve another person or forgive them or submit to them or encourage them if we don't know them. It's way less likely, likely we'll grow to love one another if we don't spend time with one another. And, and coming together in these large worship settings like we, like we are right now, these corporate settings are great because we get to, to hear the word of God taught to us and experience the word of God together. But it's really difficult to get to know one another in, in a service like this because we don't have a lot of, we have like 30 seconds for you to meet and greet. <laughs> And here's another problem with a corporate setting like this. There's a lot of great things, but another problem is there's zero accountability. Because it's so large, there's really zero accountability. That's why in our church at Niceville UMC, we've, we've built into our structure small groups. In fact, our plan A for discipleship is to think small. And we don't really have a plan B. This time together should not be your primary time of growing closer to God. It's just one of your times to grow closer to God. Our plan A for discipleship is to think small. That may sound weird, but it's to make small groups a priority in our life. We think God built that into the scriptures and so we built it into the structure of this church. Listen to our vision. Our vision is to connect people to Christ. And the way we live out that vision is our mission. It's to build a community. There at the beginning of our mission of what we're supposed to be about doing is we want to build a community where people can come as they are, meet Christ, grow in their faith, and find a place to serve. And the primary ways to grow in your faith and build a community in our church is to think small, is to have a small group, to be involved in a smaller group or smaller class. Our big rocks at the church, that means our top priorities, our worship, children and youth, or next generation ministry, and small groups. I could also add missions to that. 
Small groups is built into one of our top priorities here at this church. That's where we want to pump resources and, and, and funnel people into that. And it's not just because the Bible says so. It's because when we think small, when we get involved in a small group, it produces results in our life that we couldn't have had or God couldn't have produced without being in a group of other people, who, without being in a, in a group of other Christians who can help us in, in our relationship with God. Here's what I always say. Life is too hard to do by yourself especially when you're trying to live it at a higher level by following Jesus. We need to be in a small group. And so I'm just gonna spend the rest of this sermon just kind of giving you some good reasons why you should be involved in a small group and some scriptures to go along with that. Don't hear this as a sales pitch. Hear this coming from my heart. Here, here's the top reason you should be involved in a small group. It's because small groups provide a place for growing closer to God. It's our plan A for discipleship. Not a worship service, a small group provides a place for us to grow closer to God because we can encourage one another in small groups. I can sit up here from the pulpit and, and encourage you from the pulpit, but we can't encourage one another. I, actually, you can encourage me by giving me some nods like this sometimes and, and that sort of thing, but we can't really encourage one another in the faith unless we're in a smaller group where we can interact with one another. First Thessalonians 5, 10 through 11, Paul says that Jesus died for us so that we can live with him forever, whether we are dead or alive at the time of his return. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. See, God's got a future for us and we can put our hope in him, but the, the harsh reality of that is the second we step outside these doors, we get more discouraged than encouraged when it comes to living out the faith, right? You ever had that happen? You get pumped up by an awesome Jeremy sermon or rule sermon or something like that? <laughs> Hopefully at some point in your, this time, these three years. By the way, I've been here for three years now and I, I love y'all. I can just say that, I love y'all. I'm glad I'm here. You didn't need to clap for that, but thank you. You can, you, can be, you can be fired up about that and then walk out the doors and, and an hour later, all of a sudden the world's kind of getting you down and, and you lose that, don't you? That's how easy that is. So we need to be in an intentional group where we're encouraging one another. You've all heard the story of, of the young man who was kind of discouraged with the church and, and so he went to a wise man and the wise man kind of had a fire going and he was, the young man was telling him all about his discouragement with the church, how he really didn't feel like he needed to be a part of a church. And just silently, the old man took one of the coals out of the fire and, and placed it on the outside of the fire. And guess what happened? It slowly faded away. It slowly lost its fire. That's what happens when we get outside of that sort of community. But here's what I think happens more. I don't think it's just that we kind of slowly lose our fire. I think sometimes we get thrown into the water when we get out of the fire and it's like an immediate thing because this world has so many harsh realities and there's so many things that would want to take our attention away from Jesus Christ. We need to be in a smaller group so we can encourage one another and build each other up. We need to be encouraged in who we are in Christ because so often we forget that and the world tells us so many different things about who we really are in Christ. We can grow closer to God by encouraging one another, by receiving godly wisdom from one another and from the scriptures. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs of gratitude in your hearts to God. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. I was talking with someone recently about an important decision that they had kind of made impulsively. And, and, and he came to kind of regret his decision and had to change direction with his decision. And, and what he said kind of, kind of stood out to me about that. He said, among other things, he said, I didn't ask for my small group's input. See, small groups are a place where you don't have to try to make those kind of hard decisions by yourself. You can go to other people who know God, who have been through some of these hard times in life and, and receive godly wisdom from them and hear from one another and get godly advice. But we have to be willing to submit to one another and submit our plans and submit our lives to each other in order for that to happen. Ephesians 5, 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is not a very popular thing to talk about in our culture, but did you know that we need to submit? We have a need to submit, not try to be in control all the time. Small group allow, small groups allow for that to happen. In a small group, you'll find other people that you can receive godly wisdom to as you submit to their advice and to, and to their walk with God. We grow closer to God by studying the scriptures with one another. 
It's hard to study the scriptures on our own, isn't it? Kind of doing it in our daily devotional time. I know a lot of people who struggle with that. Sometimes I do myself. If you struggle with that, then by all means, get in a small group. Get in a small group because at least one time in your week, you're going to be intentional about getting into the scriptures. And the more we get to into the scriptures, the more we get to know God and he informs who we are and we can live how he wants us to live in love for him and in love for one another. We can live in his will like I, like I talked about last week. Small groups are an intentional place where we can study the scriptures together. At least you know you're going to go there and study the scriptures. Now, we do all kinds of studies here, sometimes based off books, sometimes based off the sermon series. But every series we do here, whether it's based off a book or not, is based off scripture. Okay? So any series we do can be, we can be studying scripture. Small groups help us grow closer to God because we can ask questions. It's a great place for people who are new Christians to get involved and ask questions in a safe place. We don't really let you ask questions here in this environment. But that is an environment where you can ask questions. And here's what I've found in my small group. A lot of times someone will ask a question and someone else will say, yeah, yeah I've been wondering that same thing. What, what, is, what is that? And we just open it up and we talk about it. One of the pieces of advice I have when we do brainstorming for our worship sessions, our series, is I say there are dumb questions and dumb ideas, you know. But that dumb question or that dumb idea may spur someone else to have a good question or a good idea. So just throw it out there. That's the body of Christ at work. It's a place where we can ask questions and, and good conversation can happen. And we can also go closer to God when we pray with one another. Every week in our small groups, we're praying together. Praying for one another. And listen, as you pray with one another and study the scriptures together and grow closer to God, what's going to happen is you're going to form this bond with one another. And you're going to want to be praying for each other. We'll lay hands on people sometime in our group that are going through a really hard time. We're constantly praying for one another. Small groups help us grow closer to God. Small groups also help us provide a place to reach out to others. You know, small groups are not just a place for discipleship, they're a place for outreach. Here at our church, our, I, I gotta say this, our group life minister, her name is Stephanie Case. I think she's awesome. I think she does a great job. One of the things that she's brought to us is this philosophy of having an open chair or an open two chairs in, in every one of our small groups. And what that means is we always wanna be thinking about the next person we can invite to our small group. Because some people don't wanna come to a large gathering like this. It's intimidating or they don't want to come into the church, but they'll go into a small group because people want to belong before they believe. It's a place just for people to come in and find that acceptance, invited by a friend. They, hopefully there's someone outside the church, but even if there's someone outside the church, just not outside the church, just someone con that's not connected with a small group. And we don't have a physical chair in our group, but we just always know that. And then once we reach our limit, then we, we stay with that limit for a while and the next cycle we start over. Here's another way we reach out through small groups. We multiply our small groups. Here at Niceville UMC, we don't just stay in the small group forever and ever and ever. <laughs> we wanna be multiplying small groups. And I know that's uncomfortable for some people to hear. But here's the, the truth of what, it's a good problem that we have here, but it's the truth, is that we have more people who wanna be in a small group here than we do small groups for them to be in and small group leaders to lead them. We, we literally have people who want to be in small groups here who can't be in a small group because we don't have enough small groups and small group leaders because we have people who get too concerned with being in their own little group and not multiplying. Listen, I know it's hard to multiply. My group is currently multiplying. We're, we're starting another group. And there's several other people in our group I think can start more groups, but we're multiplying. And it's hard because there's some people that are going to that other group that were in our group that I'm gonna really miss some really good, not just small group members, but friends that I'm gonna miss seeing every week. Like I, like I did diving into the scriptures and praying with one another and like that. But here's what I know. I'm gonna spend eternity with these people. <laughs> I'm gonna get to see them. It's not like they're going anywhere. And it's not about our comfort. If my small group wouldn't have multiplied, Christy and I, we would have gone and started our own small group by ourselves. It's just, it needs to be built into what we do as a small group 
to multiply, not just keep it to ourselves. And if you consider yourself a mature Christian, if you've been a a Christian for a, a length of time, then you need to be multiplying your small group because it's not about you and your comfort. It's about reaching out to other people. And I hope if you're not in a small group, you hear that as you begin to get in one. Small groups provide an opportunity for us to reach out to others, and they also provide an opportunity for us to do life together. We can find acceptance in a small group. Romans 15, 5 through 7, may God who gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other. That's the goal. Each with the attitude of Christ Jesus toward the other. Then all of you can join together with one voice giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. Then God will be glorified. Small groups are a place where we can be accepted. Like I said earlier, that's so critical for a military town. People moving in, even now, a place where we can, we can feel like we belong. We can find acceptance there no matter where you've come from. My small group is an amalgamation of all different people from all different walks of life. And I love it. Different age groups. But we can all find acceptance there. You know what? I can find acceptance there. We find fellowship. That's another way we do life together. We get outside these four walls and we get to know one another and fellowship with one another. You already heard how many times the Bible talks about that. And we find help for one another. Galatians 5, 13, for you have been called to live in freedom, not freedom to satisfy your sinful nature, but freedom to serve one another in love. The freedom that we have through Jesus Christ is not for ourselves, it's for the sake of other people. That's why we need to multiply. But in our small group, we can find help. I hear about small groups all the time. It happens in my small group too, where when someone has a baby, the small group comes alongside of them and provides the meals and provides the help. When someone's in the hospital, the small group comes alongside of them. When someone needs to be moved, the small group comes alongside of them. We find help. We have a congregational care minister and a connections pastor, Herstel Carter and Lou Wilder, and they are awesome. I'm so glad for them because my gift is not caring for people. And they do an incredible job of that. But listen, we can't leave everything up to them. them. Them and their teams, they can't do everything. We need to be caring for one another. I'm so bad at caring for people. I have someone else in my small group that's in charge of that. But we need that. We need to be caring for one another and helping each other. Because small groups are also a place where we can do life together, but they're also a place where we can provide a place for needs to be met. Small groups are a place for our needs to be met. When we need help, when we get stuck in something where we can't figure it out or we're going through a hard time, they're also a place for us to help meet the needs of others. And we have a need to meet the need of others. Did you know that? Some of the most fulfilling time in our life is when we serve other people and help other people, isn't it? It's tiring, but it's fulfilling. We have a a small group here that I was blessed to kind of get to know a little bit. The Pearson small group led by Philip and Annie Pearson. And and they um, had a young couple come into their group kind of unexpectedly over this past year. And I just want you to watch a video of, of just what God did when a small group really acted like what the small group is supposed to be like. So just, just watch this video. The way I was raised is pretty unique. Um, the work my dad did, we moved state to state, 36 states to be exact. Um, partial education, I was homeschooled partially. I went to first grade for about two or three weeks and you know, self-taught. Started working full time when I was probably 12 and been going on since then. Time to time, we was in between jobs and you know we had to live on the streets, but um, I found families that were willing to take me in and raise me as their own. Through that, I went to homeschool for partially and I pretty much just got a fourth, fifth grade education. I'm pretty much self-taught and you know, like I said, I lived with people, they took care of me, raised me as their own, tried to get me in school, but there was just different technicalities that didn't let me prevail in that area, but I still strive to, to get knowledge and taught myself everything I know. My story is almost the same. At age 18, I had about third and fourth grade level uh, education as well. I moved to Fort Smith with a friend of mine to try and get a job and get on my feet on my own there. And I met Zachary through meeting some new friends in town. 
Zach and Stephanie first made contact with our church through the Supper on Saturday program. I remember the first day that Zach was in our small group. I remember looking across the table at him and wondering, what is he doing here? He's so young. But it was kind of unusual for a couple half my age, more than half my age, to want to be in our group. I mean, do 21 and 22 year olds really want to hang out with 40 and 50 somethings? Here comes a young couple in our class and we say, uh, I think you're in the wrong class. We say that to ourselves, not out loud. All of a sudden they were part of our group and little by little, we each got to know them every Sunday. We learned that uh, they weren't married and, and the church was going through the marriage series at that time. So a couple of us guys decided we'd go over one Sunday afternoon and, and talk to Zach about uh, whether or not that was in their plans. And when he said yes, and we, we told him basically, hey, we'll make it happen. We'll cover the cost. And once we got involved, then I started telling their story to all sorts of people. And before I knew it, everybody else wanted to be a part and help too. Annie Pearson's husband, Philip, has just been amazing. He's a teacher, and we, we hit it off real big when we first met him. We talked a lot. He's taught me a lot. We went through the scriptures a bunch, and um, he came over to my house one day, and um, he offered to pay for my wedding. I was speechless, and speechless still. It was this amazing event, that, and he, he took it upon himself to actually do that for me at a, at a hard, tough time uh, financially. and. Um, Sure enough, three months later, we were married on the beach and had a honeymoon that we'll remember for the rest of our lives. They have really helped change our lives and get us closer to God, and it's been an amazing experience. We got in there, I mean, we've created this bond that it just can't be broken. I mean, it's just good Christian people, and they've made us um, what we are today, and it's just inspiration both ways, and um, it's, it's just awesome. This whole body of Christ thing has really impressed me that uh, one person's in charge of, you know, we got hands, we got feet, we got grill masters, we got bridesmaids, we got Jeremy doing the ceremony, uh, and it all just came together so beautifully that everybody does a little part, and before you know it, beautiful day. Isn't that awesome? That's the church at its best right there. That's what a small group is at its best, taking care of each other, doing life together, growing closer to God together. You notice that they came to this church through SOS, Supper on Saturday, which also started out of a small group. <laughs> small groups at work right there. There's different ways to get involved with a small group. If you look on the back of your bulletin, just look on the back of your bulletin in the notes section, it gives you all different kinds of ways to be involved. You can go to our uh, Group Life open houses this Wednesday and next Wednesday where small group leaders are, are there. You can get to meet some of the small group leaders and see who you like and don't like and that sort of thing. Uh, just check that out. Complete a G Harmony survey you saw it commercial for earlier uh, online. You can go to Stephanie Case, our awesome group life minister. Ask the folks at the welcome desk. Just ask a friend who's already in one. And if you're already in a small group, let me see who, all you who are already in a small group. It needs to be a lot more than that, but that's good. I'm proud of you. If you're already in a small group and you're not helping lead, then become an apprentice. We have this apprentice system where you kind of learn under the leader and you go and multiply your own group. Do that. Listen, I'm, I'm not the world's best small group leader. I'm not. I, I don't really, I, sometimes I'm, I, I feel like, did anybody get anything out of that today? <laughs> but it's worth it. So become an apprentice, or if you're leading a small group but don't have an apprentice, pray about someone you can ask to do that, to multiply later. If you're in a group but you're not inviting someone, then invite someone. It's a place for people to, for us to reach out. Or if you're in a group that hasn't multiplied in years, then now's your time. Pray and plan. Pray about and plan a way to multiply, to reach other people. The point is, everybody needs to be doing something when it comes to small groups. Because when we think small, there's big results in our life, in our personal life with God and in the, in the life of other people. It's like the, the first church in Acts 2. They, they broke bread together. They fellowshiped together. They studied the scriptures together. They worshiped together. And here's what it said. And God added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's think small and just see what God does. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time to be together. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here. And, and God, Lord, just give us a, a longing to want to fulfill that, 
need for community in our life to get in a small group, Lord. I pray for uh, those who aren't in small groups right now to take a step of courage and of faith and to trust you in that. And those who are in a small group to, to trust you in multiplying and reaching out to other people, Lord. Just, just give us a vision of what that will really do in our lives. Thank you that you designed us this way. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand and let's worship. Thank you for listening to our message today. I hope that you've been inspired to act upon what you've just heard and become a doer of the word. Feel free to contact us through the information on the screen or through our website. Better yet, if you're ever in the Niceville, Florida area, feel free to stop by and visit us at the Niceville United Methodist Church.